I am Jane Goodall, written by Brad Meltzer, illustrated by Christopher Eliopoulos. I am Jane Goodall. I am Jane Goodall. On my first birthday, my father bought me a cuddly toy chimpanzee named Jubilee. Jubilee, meet Jane. I loved Jubilee. I mean, loved. I used to carry Jubilee with me everywhere. As I got older, when I'd line up all my toys and play teacher, Jubilee was the one who had his own chair. Okay, class, now who knows what rabbits like to eat? Yes, Jubilee, correct as always. I didn't just love my toy chimpanzee, though. I loved all animals, even the earthworms I found in the garden. Did you bring earthworms inside the house? Don't worry, Mum. They're safe as can be, right under my pillow. My mom told me the worms would be safer in the garden, so we took them outside and buried them back in their home. At five years old, I was curious to learn how chickens lay eggs, so I crawled into my grandmother's hen house to watch. At first, all the hens were scared of me. Then I decided to crouch in the corner. If I had moved, the hens would have run away. I was patient, though. Finally, after all the hours of waiting, I saw what I was looking for. The hen gave a little wiggle and... Plop! There was an egg. Where were you? You've been missing for so long, we sent out a search party. You'll never believe where eggs come from. It was my first research project. In addition to animals, I also loved nature. I named the chestnut tree Nookie and the beech tree Beech. Beech was my favorite. Thank you, Beech, for letting me read up here. Oh, that was another thing I loved, reading. Back then, my family didn't have a lot of money. To get books, we went to the library. When I was seven years old, I got a book that would change my life. It was called The Story of Dr. Doolittle. I read it once, then read it again, then read it a third time before I had to go back to the library. It was about a man who could talk to animals. In the book, there's a parrot who says that if you want to learn how to talk to animals, you need the power of observation. But what I remember most is the part where Dr. Doolittle and his animal friends are being chased and they come to a cliff. How are we ever going to get across? A bridge, quick, make a bridge. Right there, the monkeys joined hands and feet. They became the bridge. Isn't that beautiful? We can accomplish anything by working together. After reading that book, I vowed that I would go to Africa and live among the animals. By the time I was 12, I had my own nature group, the Alligator Club. My friends and I raised money to help old horses. We took nature walks and wrote down what we saw, or at least I did. And if you wanted to have high rank in the club, you have to be able to recognize 10 dogs, 10 birds, 10 trees, and 5 butterflies or moths. How about I go first? Something tells me that she's going to name them all perfectly. Each of us had our own animal name. Jane was the Red Admiral, named after the beautiful butterfly. Was I the best student? Not really. On school days, it was hard for me to wake up, but I didn't like being indoors. But if we were outside, or there were animals around, that's when I'd get excited. Guess how many pets I had? There was a lizard with no legs named Ivor, a guinea pig named Gandhi and Jimmy, racing snails with numbers painted on them, Pickles the cat, Hamlet the hamster, and Peter the canary. And that didn't include the dogs I looked after, like my favorite Rusty, who liked wearing pajamas. Oof. That means he likes pajamas. 
I wanted a job where I could learn more about animals, but back then, if you were a girl, people didn't think you could become a scientist. They expected girls to become nurses, secretaries, or teachers. I wanted to go to Africa. I wanted to study animals. Luckily, my mom always told me, if you really want something, work hard for it. If you don't give up, you'll find a way. I never forgot that. Soon I had my chance. One of my school friends invited me to visit her family in Kenya. That's right, in Africa! To pay for the trip, I worked as a waitress and hid my money under the carpet. One day, I closed the curtains and counted it all, and I've got enough! I'm going to Africa! The trip took 21 days by boat. I was 23 years old. It all seemed like a dream until I saw a giraffe who stared directly at me. It had dark eyes, long lashes, a black tongue, and was chewing acacia thorns. I knew my dream was coming alive. Finally, I was in the Africa of Dr. Doolittle. Two months later, my life changed again. Someone told me, if you are interested in animals, you must meet Dr. Lewis Leakey. Nice to meet you. I'm Jane Goodall. I hear you like animals. You have no idea. Dr. Leakey was an anthropologist, which means he studied how humans live, and also a paleontologist, which means he studied fossils and bones. At first, he hired me as a secretary. But he was quickly impressed with all what I knew about animals, including his own pets. Eventually, Dr. Leakey told me about a new job studying chimpanzees up close. He said going into the forest would be hard, it would be dangerous, but if we could find out how chimps live today, we'd learn more about how our own prehistoric ancestors used to live. I have no college degree, no training, and no experience, but I want that job. Jane, I've been waiting for you to say that. For a year, I read everything I could about chimpanzees. They're always observed in a lab. No one has studied them in the jungle where they actually live. I was also told that women couldn't be alone in the forest. They said I needed a guide, plus a companion. My mum offered to come. I was ready. I knew you wouldn't give up. I'll never forget that day. July 16, 1960. The day I first set foot in what is today Gombe National Park in Tanzania, Africa. At 26 years old, I had finally made it to the home of chimpanzees. It was a place that would change my life. During one of my first explorations, we saw two chimpanzees eating in a tall tree. They noticed us and ran away. They're scared of us. The next day, we didn't see any chimps. There were no chimps the day after that either. For months, I'd try to get close, but they kept running away. Then I started going alone, just me. I'd go, high, I'd go to a high area called the peak and look down with my binoculars. This was my secret. Be patient. Learn how they lived. Slowly move closer and closer. In time, I saw that the chimpanzees would hang out in groups of six or fewer. The female chimps would be with children. The male chimps would be with one another. These weren't mindless animals. This was a community. Still, it took nearly a year before I could get within 100 yards of the chimpanzees. One day, I came back to camp and found out one of the male chimpanzees took our food, including your bananas. Fantastic! That means they're not scared of me now. I bet he'll be back tomorrow. The next day, I waited and waited. There were no chimpanzees in sight. Then, at 4 p.m., I heard a rustling noise by my tent. It was the large male chimpanzee with the thick beard. David Greybeard. <laughs> that was the name I gave him. 
Back then, people told me there was a certain way to study animals that I shouldn't give chimpanzees names. They said animals were supposed to have numbers, not names. Why? They thought animals didn't have personalities or emotions. They thought that if we gave them names, we'd start pretending they were like us. But that's what no one realized. They were like us. That day, David Greybeard took my nuts and my bananas. A month later, he took one from my hand. Even later, out in the forest, he slowly approached me and checked to see if I had a banana in my pocket. It was one of my proudest moments, having the other chimpanzees now understand that I wasn't a threat. I was their friend, and they were mine. Over time, by seeing the chimpanzees as individuals, I could truly understand them. Who wants another banana? David was calm, though he liked getting what he wanted. It's okay, pal, calm down. Goliath was easily excited. William was shy. Old Flo was a strong mother, always bringing her daughter and son. As I watched, I learned one of the coolest things of all. One day, I saw David Greybeard stripping leaves from a twig and then sticking the twig into a termite mound. He wasn't just using the twig as a tool, he had made that tool. Before that, scientists thought only humans could make tools. There was no doubt now that these animals were intelligent. Every night, I'd write in my journal about what I observed. And every day, I saw the chimpanzees doing the same things we do. Holding hands, tickling, kissing, even patting backs to reassure one another. The more I observed, the more I learned. Soon, I had so much information I needed a tape recorder. Then, I needed an assistant to help observe all the other chimpanzee families in the forest. Six years later, what started with a notepad and binoculars became a full research center. Now I was the one in charge. Isn't it wonderful? Look what we can build together. Today, thanks to our work in Tanzania, the whole world knows that animals have their own personalities and complex relationships. In my life, people told me there was a certain way to do things, a certain way to study animals, a certain way that girls should behave. They told me to follow the rules. Instead, I followed my gut. In your life, it will be easy to see how others are different from you. But there's so much more to gain if you instead see how alike we all are. All of us, all living things, share so much. We have so many things in common. When we realize that and look out for each other, that's the most beautiful way to live together. Today, Dr. Goodall's work has grown reminding people everywhere that we all share this earth every day. When we protect the planet, we protect each other. Even now, along with the Jane Goodall Institute, she's working to save endangered species, including her beloved chimpanzees, while also taking care of our environment. With more than 150,000 groups of young people in 130 plus countries, the Roots and Shoots Network connects youth of all ages who share a desire to create a better world. Give them a call. You can be an environmentalist too. Want to work with animals one day? Watch your favorite animals and see what they do. Make notes, read books about them. They're so much like us. I am Jane Goodall, and I see so much that we have in common. Watch. Observe. Be patient. It'll teach you this. We don't own this earth. We share it. Listen to the feelings in your heart. We are responsible for the animals around us. We must take care of them. When one of us is in trouble, be it human, creature, or nature itself, we must reach out and help. When we do, we build a bridge. 
a bridge that will carry all of us. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference, and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. Jane Goodall And here at the bottom, you can see we have a timeline of Jane Goodall's life. And at the top, of course, you'll see the lovely Jane Goodall with one of her beloved chimpanzees. So we have April 3rd, 1934, born in London, England. November 1941, reads the story of Dr. Doolittle by Hugh Lofting. 1957, first visit to Africa, meets Louis Leakey. July 16th, 1960, first day in Gombe National Park, Tanzania. November 4th, 1960, observes David Greybeard using a twig as a tool. 1966, receives Ph.D. in Ethology, Cambridge University. Jane, 1967, Jane's son Hugo, nicknamed Grub, is born. 1967, publishes book My Friends the Wild Chimpanzees. 1977, founds the Jane Goodall Institute. 1991, first meeting that inspires roots and shoots. And today, Jane is still alive and working to protect chimpanzees and our environment. And in our top left corner, we see Jane as a toddler with Jubilee. In the top right corner, we see Jane with David Greybeard, early 1960s. Bottom left, Jane with Dr. Leakey. And bottom right, Jane with Roots and Shoots members.